Hey guys, it's Dr. Price with Action Potential Mentoring, and we're going to be covering the highest yield MSK and ortho concepts for the USMLE Step 2 CK. If you want to stay in contact, my Twitter is action underscore AP. And then the website for one-on-one help is actionpotentialmentoring.com. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. All right, so let's start off with some 260 plus scoring USMLE associations with rheumatoid arthritis that 99% of students do not know. Number one is Kaplan syndrome, and number two is Felty syndrome. So Kaplan syndrome is essentially rheumatoid arthritis plus pneumoconiosis. If you see both of those together, Kaplan syndrome is your answer. They can also ask you, rather than an answer choice actually being Kaplan syndrome, they could say, which of the following can be highly associated with rheumatoid arthritis? And the answer could be pneumoconiosis. And it's thought to be from a carryover of the immune response in patients that have rheumatoid arthritis that spend a lot of time in coal mines or breathed in a bunch of silicon and had silicosis or asbestosis. And then number two is Felty syndrome, and it's a triad. You have to know all three parts. So it's rheumatoid arthritis plus neutropenia plus spenomegaly. And so here's a nice little chart that you guys need to know. And so the clinical features of Felty syndrome, just to reiterate, is rheumatoid arthritis. So obviously you'll see severe erosive joint disease, they could have rheumatoid nodules. Uh, they also have the neutropenia with an absolute neutrophil count less than 1,500, and that's a good number to keep in the back of your mind, and then splenomegaly, okay? And so these patients will have an anti-CCP and an RF positive 90% of the time, and also they're generally almost always going to have an elevated ESR above 85. And so the peripheral smear and the bone marrow biopsy is going to be done to perform to rule out other causes of neutropenia because they may have some sort of underlying leukemia that you can't just say, oh, this is Felty syndrome because they have neutropenia and rheumatoid arthritis. You obviously want to do the next best step in the question stem would be a peripheral smear and then a bone marrow biopsy if non-diagnostic. So here's a nice mnemonic for Felty syndrome is Santa, S for splenomegaly, A for anemia, N for neutropenia, T for thrombocytopenia, and then A for arthritis, which is rheumatoid arthritis. All right. Some more high yields about rheumatoid arthritis. The diagnostic from most specific to least specific. The first one is anti-CPA. So that's your anti-citrullinated protein antibody. This is your most specific. Number two is positive rheumatoid factor, which is an anti-IgG antibody. Then number three is elevated ESR and CRP. Remember, this means almost nothing. It just shows that there's inflammation of some sort in the body. It's seen very, very commonly with autoimmune disorders. Classically, in question stems, a super high ESR is often associated with giant cell arteritis. And like we just saw with Felty syndrome, you can have an ESR over 85. All right, the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis is a DMARD. Most commonly is going to be methotrexate. Remember, DMARD stands for disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. And so methotrexate is usually the first thing that will get started for moderate rheumatoid arthritis. Second-line drugs include hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine. Here's a picture of what your hands look like with rheumatoid arthritis. All right. And then kind of like a last line agent is a TNF-alpha inhibitor for rheumatoid arthritis. But what do you need to check before initiation? This shows up on test questions all the time. So you want to check a PPD. You want to make sure that the patient isn't at risk of a latent TB reactivation. Because if they have tuberculosis just chilling and you give them a TNF-alpha inhibitor, they could go right back into an infected state. And so... Remember, if somebody has latent tuberculosis, the treatment has been updated. About a decade ago, they updated it, and it's finally starting to reflect on the test. And so you would do weekly isoniazid plus weekly rifapentine for three months. And so the old kind of criteria of treatment was daily isoniazid for nine months. MBME is not going to ask you that anymore. There's better options nowadays, so you would not use the daily isoniazid for nine months. If you can afford the rifapentine, essentially that's the way to go. It's going to save you six months of treatment and also you just take the isoniazid and rifapentine weekly rather than every single day isoniazid. And so one of the benefits of doing that is you don't get all the side effects of isoniazid of the neurotoxicity and the hepatitis. Remember, anytime you take isoniazid, you want to supplement vitamin B6 to help prevent the neuropathic symptoms. All right, next, number four, psoriatic arthritis. To diagnose, you're going to look for a positive HLA B27 with a pencil in cup deformity of your fingers. So your fingers are going to kind of look pointed like a pencil in cup. And so these patients will generally have a negative rheumatoid factor in ANA. 
So the treatment first line agents for psoriatic arthritis is NSAIDs and celecoxib. Second line treatment is methotrexate, leflunamide, or TNF-alpha inhibitors. Number five, ankylosing spondylitis. Look for this in a young male that's HLA B27 positive over 90% of the time. They're going to have negative rheumatoid factor and ANA just like psoriatic arthritis, but their x-ray will show sacroiliitis and SI or vertebral joint fusion. So psoriatic arthritis, I want you thinking that fingers are pencil and cup. Ankylosing spondylitis, look for a bamboo spine or a fused SI joint or vertebral joint fusion. And so the treatment first line for ankylosing spondylitis, if it's an answer choice, is physical therapy and exercise. If that's not an answer choice, go with NSAIDs or celecoxib. And then third line is TNF-alpha inhibitors. All right, so number six here is a quick recap of a lot of the first line treatments you need to know. For osteoarthritis, First line is exercise and NSAID. You can also then branch out to acetaminophen and celecoxib. For psoriatic arthritis, your first line is going to be NSAID or celecoxib. For rheumatoid arthritis, you want to give them methotrexate as the first line. Ankylosing spondylitis, the first line is going to be physical therapy. Remember, if that's not an answer choice, you can also do NSAID. Then for gout, you would do NSAID for acute or allopurinol and febuxostat for chronic. And then for pseudo gout, if it's one joint, you can do a steroid injection. And if it's multiple joints, you can give them NSAIDs or colchicine. And so if you go through this list really quick, just as a way to categorize these in your mind, look at all the things that NSAIDs are used for. Osteoarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis if physical therapy is not an option, acute gout, and then pseudogout affecting more than one joint. So essentially everything on this list is very effectively treated with an NSAID, except for rheumatoid arthritis. So that's one way that I kind of tie this all together in my head. All right, some quick hit scenarios for your USMLE. Let's go through four of them. If somebody has non-inflammatory arthritis of their DIP and their PIP joints, that's osteoarthritis. If your PIP and your MCPs are wrecked, that's going to be rheumatoid arthritis. So osteoarthritis affects more distally in your fingers. So your DIP and your PIP. Whereas rheumatoid arthritis is your PIP and your MCP, your metacarpophalangeal joints. What if it's a 25-year-old male that has low back pain that gets better with physical therapy? That's going to be ankylosing spondylitis. And then if you see pencil and cup deformity of your DP joints, that's psoriatic arthritis. Remember, like we talked about, psoriatic arthritis' treatment is NSAID or celecoxib. All right, here's a trick question for septic arthritis that I've seen tested on an old NBME. So to diagnose, you want to do a synovial fluid aspiration. This is the best diagnostic test. And it will likely show over 50,000 white blood cells with a neutrophil predominance, showing that there's an acute infection or inflammatory process. But the gram stain can be negative for bacterial growth in some instances. Well, what's your next best step? Because if the gram stain is negative, they want you to think that, oh, this might not be septic arthritis. But if the clinical picture points you directly to septic arthritis, you still want to put them on bancomycin because staph aureus is the most common cause, even if the culture is negative, whenever you do the synovial fluid aspiration. So you see septic arthritis with a negative culture, put them on bancomycin to cover the staph aureus. Number nine, Lyme disease can cause arthritis months later. This is late stage Lyme and a lot of people forget about it after step one. And so you want to look for arthritis with encephalopathy. And so recall that early Lyme has the erythema chronica migrans target rash, got the central clearing. And then so disseminated Lyme is going to have lymphocytic meningitis, as well as bilateral Bell's palsy and an AV block. All right. And then so to diagnose Lyme disease, you want to do an ELISA and then confirm with a Western blot. So screening test ELISA, confirmatory test, Western blot. You have to know that it's very high yield for your test. How do you treat Lyme disease? So I'm going to go through all this in a methodical way and then kind of give you a cheat sheet shortcut way to remember it. So early localized Lyme with just a rash. First line is going to be doxycycline for two weeks. If you're pregnant, you would do amoxicillin or cefuroxime for three weeks. And don't forget that if you're nursing, you still would give the amoxicillin or cefuroxime instead of doxycycline. You don't want to give a pregnant or nursing patient doxycycline. If it's early disseminated Lyme, these patients would have meningitis or Bell's palsy. If it's just Bell's palsy, give them doxycycline still. But if they have meningitis or the carditis symptoms, you can give them an IV third generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone or penicillin G for four weeks. And then if it's late Lyme with arthritis or encephalopathy, you give them doxy or amoxicillin for a month. So the easiest way I remember this 
is these two lines right here. So if there's a rash, Bell's palsy or arthritis, which all is kind of like less severe type symptoms, you give them doxycycline. If it's much more severe, such as encephalopathy or meningitis or carditis, so brain or heart stuff, you're going to give them IV ceftriaxone. And so that summarizes it in my mind. And then I just remember, oh, you wouldn't give a pregnant lady doxycycline. So then you can use the cefuroxine, for example, or amoxicillin. All right, here is a one-liner that is a super hard question I saw. So it was a patient with a month of joint pain with four-month history of neck stiffness, numb and weak extremities, facial palsy, and no deep tendon reflexes. So if you skim over this and you don't see the facial palsy, you're going to completely miss this diagnosis being Lyme disease. And so they said, what's the next best step to achieve your diagnosis? And so they wanted you to get a Borrelia burgdorferi antibody level. And so that's a tough question, but that was the only answer choice that pointed towards it being Lyme disease. And so if you see that facial palsy, don't forget that you want to be looking for Borrelia burgdorferi antibody levels to help clue you into Lyme disease. All right, number 10. A microarthritis test question that many people miss. So a 20-year-old with pain and swelling in bilateral knees plus pustules on the hands that are painless, what's your diagnosis? Well, you're thinking gonococcal arthritis. If you see a younger patient with arthritis, you should start thinking of sexually transmitted such as Neisseria gonococcus arthritis. And the treatment is going to be ceftriaxone plus empiric doxycycline. And the doxycycline is to help cover chlamydia prophylaxis per the NBME. So note that the pustules are usually small and painless on your hands with gonococcal arthritis. Number 11, what cancers metastasize to the bones most commonly? So a nice little mnemonic is permanently relocated tumors like bones, PRTLB. So you have prostate, which forms blastic lesions, renal cell carcinoma, testes and thyroid, lung, and then breast. And so breast can also be blastic, but it's most of the time lytic. So the only ones on this list that should metastasize to the bones and be blastic all the time is prostate. And then occasionally on the test, they'll give you a breast lesion that's blastic, but that's very rare. The rest will all be lytic lesions. So the mnemonic is permanently relocated tumors like bones. All right, number 12. If you're tender at the anatomical snuff box, what's your next best step? We well, want to do an x-ray of the hand. And so what if the x-ray is normal? They're almost always going to tell you this in the question stem. X-ray is normal, but you still have high suspicion for a scaphoid fracture. Well, you're going to put the wrist in a thumb spica cast or splint and then X-ray again in one to two weeks. But if the question asks, what is the most sensitive test for a scaphoid fracture? The answer would be MRI. A high yield test question is to watch for avascular necrosis of the scaphoid bone, and it's because of the retrograde blood flow of the bone itself. All right. Number 13, a Montezia fracture versus a Galeazzi fracture. So I'm going to just break it down real quick and skip ahead and show you the mnemonic mugger because it's going to make it a lot easier. M-U-G-R. Montezia is ulnar fracture. Galeazzi is radial fracture. So knowing the mnemonic mugger, let's go through this. Montezia fracture. You want to diagnose this with an x-ray. It's somebody that fell on an outstretched hand with their forearm pronated. And so this is going to be an ulnar fracture. Remember, M-U-G-R. Montesia is ulnar fracture. Galeazzi fracture. So for G-R, remember that it's a radial fracture. It can also have a dislocated radial ulnar joint. And so the treatment for both of these is going to be surgery. All right, here's another good test question. If you have an old lady that falls and now she has petechiae all over her chest, what's your diagnosis? Well, you're thinking it's a femur fracture with fat emboli. And so they will usually have hypoxemia on the ABG in these questions. What's the treatment? Well, the treatment's going to be supportive care. These patients oftentimes will resolve without any ad future sequelae. And so a high yield note that you need to know is that this can be seen after liposuction too. So look for a question stem of a patient that just got plastic surgery and now has petechiae all over the chest with hypoxemia. You're thinking fat embolism. But in real life, just know that only one third of patients with fat embolism are going to have the petechiae. So they may not have it in the test question, but if they're trying to make it very clear, they're going to give it to you. Number 17, a Colley's fracture. So this is a fall on an outstretched hand in a patient oftentimes with osteoporosis. And so the treatment is a long arm sugar tongue cast. 
This is often compared and contrasted with a Smith fracture. So this is a fall on a flexed wrist, but literally, I don't know who would fall like this. All right, so look at the picture right here. Here's a Smith's fracture. How are you gonna fall on your wrist like this? All right, so that treatment is obviously gonna be a cast. Number 19, torn meniscus. Look for this in a patient that had a twisting injury that now has a clicking and locking of the knee joint. So you're gonna diagnose this with clinical exam and you can also get an MRI. The treatment is gonna be NSAIDs plus physical therapy, which has equal outcomes to arthroscopic surgery. I actually tore my left meniscus during track in high school and ended up never being a problem down the road after I rehabilitated it. All right, so number 20, if you have a trauma a herniated disc or spinal epidural hematoma or cancer that compressed the cauda equina, what's your next best step? Well, you wanna get an MRI to diagnose this and then immediately to surgery. And so this is a surgical emergency every single time on your answer choice for your test questions. They could give you answer choices like steroids to decrease the inflammation or whatever they want, but that's incorrect. Just go straight to surgery. It's not worth delaying. All right, number 21, more USMLE clinical diagnoses. If somebody has back pain 24 hours a day, which aggressively gets worse at night, but they also have weight loss, you're thinking cancer. Number two, if they have saddle anesthesia with bowel or bladder dysfunction, you should be thinking cauda equina syndrome. Number three, a low back pain in an osteoporotic patient is oftentimes a vertebral compression fracture on the USMLE. And so they could give you the fish mouth vertebrae appearance to clue you in. And then number four, an abnormal gait where the knees and hips are flexed in the patient is spondylolisthesis. All right, so this is where the vertebrae essentially moves forward on each other. Number two, a patient that has pain with active abduction, meaning they can't lift over 60 degrees of their arm, but they have no pain with passive abduction, this is a rotator cuff injury. And so the supraspinatus muscle right here is usually your answer on the USMLE. So if it hurts to move it on your own, but if somebody else moves it, it doesn't hurt. You're thinking it's the muscle because it's literally the muscle that's hurting and straining when you try to do it. So your treatment is going to be rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation with physical therapy. And so if you see the question stem that has pain with both active and passive overhead shoulder movement, plus locking after a trauma, you're thinking a torn glenoid labrum. I saw that in an old NBME, so I wanted to include it. And then number 23, what is this image and how do you treat it? Patient got this first metatarsophalangeal joint pain after taking a loop diuretic like furosemide. So see how that this is red and inflamed right here? You're thinking gout. And so this is an acute flare that you would treat with NSAID, colchicine, or steroids. And then chronic, remember, is allopurinol or febuxostat. Some high yield clues to improve your test taking here. These will really save you a lot of time if you can internalize these and understand them. If there's a fracture, you're almost always going to see this on the x-ray on your USMLE, unless it's a scaphoid fracture, they usually won't show you that. If there is a nerve palsy, you want to look for other nerve symptoms, such as maybe some sensory loss or some other accompanying muscles could also be paralyzed. But also look for muscular disuse atrophy if it's a long-term palsy that somebody's had for a while. If there's an infected joint, look for elevated white blood cells or erythema. If it's autoimmune, look for other symptoms in the question stem. And then if there's tendinitis, it's going to have a normal x-ray, okay? But if there's a dislocation, you will see the actual joint dislocated on the x-ray. These are just five or six little quick hitting clues to improve your test taking. That saved me a lot of time. If I see a normal x-ray, I'm like, okay, this might be tendinitis. If it's of the hand, it might be a scaphoid fracture. And then obviously a palsy would have a normal x-ray as well. But if there's a dislocation or a fracture, you're usually going to see that on the x-ray. So this is some of the highest yield MSK and ortho tie-ins. I hope that this has been helpful. Subscribe, share this video with a friend that's also studying for the US SMLE and give the video a like to help the algorithm. It's Dr. Price with Action Potential and I will be releasing more. So turn on notifications if you would like them as well. Take care, guys.